My name is Stephanie Sehan. I am a session academic here at QUT. I also um, tutor at the uh, Ujuru unit, which is an important um, scheme in order to ensure that we bridge the equity for our Indigenous students. Before I begin, um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners on the land where QUT now stands and pay my respects to their elders past, present and, and emerging and acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people uh, continue to play within the QUT community. QUT has always been a place of education, um, including uh, before uh, our buildings, uh, which we now use uh, for that purpose. I would like to welcome all our guests here today. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, in particular, Uncle Bob Anderson, who is uh, well known for both striving to progress and protect the rights of workers through the trade union movement, and also his efforts uh, to maintain and promote the reconciliation process. As a member and a delegate of the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples, Uncle Bob Anderson is also a patron of the TJ Ryan Foundation and we welcome him and thank him for being here and joining us today. Uncle Bob will give us our acknowledgement to country as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, delighted to be able to participate in this uh, great gathering. At, um, strengthens our resolve on who we are and uh, what we are about. Uh, as a Jagger elder with the connections with the uh, Konamuka people also and with uh, bloodline connections to this country, uh, I would use the words uh, Wanya Wanya, Nyariwa Wanya, Garandan and Army, Tuju, Moby Rono, Garandan and Army. Welcome to this land, Aboriginal land, land of the Turrbal people, land of the Jagger, Eurable and other national groups um, identified uh, whose waters flow mostly eastward to the sea. I'm delighted to speak. Uh, 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 political activity is the, uh, some of the key, or one of the key notes of what brings us together and what constitutes political activity. I was born at um, uh, house number 20 over in Street East Brisbane in 1929 and uh, growing up in East Brisbane my Aboriginal mother who was born at a fisherman's camp at Cran, Baran Minjaraba and grew up on Moongalba, the Aboriginal mission on Minjaraba, Stradbrook Island that people may not have known, the big Aboriginal mission on Stradi, uh, a favourite spot for, uh, uh, for tourists now. And my mum Lydia would say to me, be home by dark, always be home by dark. And I learned years later that there was a curfew law that existed in Brisbane that blacks had to be out beyond the boundaries by dark and the Rafferdex in Brisbane will indicate those three boundary streets. Uh, years later, during the years of uh, uh, the regime of Lord Mayor Jim Sawley, a, a wonderful process was undergone and that involved uh, people in all walks of, walks of life uh, to formally dissolve that iniquitous uh, act uh, that uh, bound Aboriginal people uh, to that process. That's part of the political activity. As a, uh, a young lad working for the uh, BAFS, the Brisbane Associated Friendly Societies Dispensary, who had a big store at the corner of George and Turbot Street, I was employed there at 14 years of age as a junior storeman. I get the tram home at uh, half past 12 on Saturday and when the tram came over the Victoria Bridge around the Palace Hotel area on the South Brisbane side where all the blacks uh, would gather over there, the Aboriginal people, who weren't allowed in the city, I'd jump off the tram if I saw a familiar face. And one of those familiar faces was a man, an Aboriginal man, by the name of Clive Martin who was a political activist, and remember, this is 1943, and I'm 14 years of age. And uh, that man used to have a, he put out a publication, print their own publication, called the Abo Voice, which was giving voice to the points of view of Aboriginal people. So 
in the, in the South Brisbane area or whatever the catchment area might be, so Aboriginal people are aware of the politics of the day and how to go about uh, involving themselves in that process. So that's part of the, um, uh, the journey that I made and my observations. The gathering place used to be the Palace Hotel, just as you come over the South Bank. And on uh, Saturday afternoon, at, uh, uh, if I saw a, a face that I knew, I'd jump off the tram and go and have a talk to people like Clive e. Martin, I do recall those things. And when I got home, of course, I'd say to my Aboriginal mother, uh, guess who I saw today? And she'd say, somebody from Dunwich, which, which was true, so it was a positive identification that I had who I was and what I was about. The other thing I'll conclude on saying too that Aboriginal people uh, uh, lived under in Queensland lived under the shadow of the Queensland Act, and the formal title of the Queensland Act was the Restriction of the Sale of Opium and the Aboriginal Protection Act. You can Google that and get some information from there. And uh, parts of that act were quite clear on where Aboriginal people could go and could not go. And that was my experience too, and I'll close on this note. But as a trade union organiser, the many times I spent in Townsville, in North Queensland, when the uh, boat used to come over from Palm Island, which was a, uh, you'd say, a, uh, a, 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 a sort of a semi-prison uh, island where Aboriginal people were uh, housed over there, that Aboriginal people coming over to the city for either uh, medication, doctor's appointments, or formal appointments uh, at, uh, uh, with, with, with some form of law administration. And uh, when the, uh, the launch went back to Palm Island uh, at a certain time in the afternoon, if the Aboriginal people weren't back aboard that boat, uh, orders would be arrested, uh, uh, issued for their arrest. So that's part of the, uh, the history of this uh, the status connection. So, and when, when we talk about political activity, it is the activity that was engendered amongst the Aboriginal people to combat that, those iniquitous laws and to a degree still do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uncle Bob. And so I'd formally like to welcome you to our Indigenous Human Rights uh, Seminar. Thank you all for being here today. It is great to see um, all your lovely faces, those who have joined us before. Thank you again for coming. Um, now, we have a slight change in person in the program. Um, but before we do that, can I please ask that people put their mobile phones on silent? Um, we are recording, however, we are not live. Um, so we are recording for the purpose of actually uh, keeping a copy, but we're not live at the moment. So if you can turn down your phones, that will be great. So for the first part of our session, we are going to hear from a number of uh, important speakers. Professor Margaret Reynolds, thank you very much for, for joining us. Professor Henry Reynolds and, of course, Uncle Bob Anderson, thank you all for being here. Um, Victor Hart was uh, unfortunately unable to join us today. So Professor Roger Scott, um, who many of you may already be familiar with, um, Professor Scott was, uh, is our Executive Director of the TJ Ryan Foundation. He was also the Vice-Chancellor of Canberra University um, and very importantly uh, in his last role, Director General of the Department of Education. He is also the Dean of the Arts um, here at QUT. So Roger is going to be chairing uh, the panel discussion this morning. Um, so thank you, Roger, and I'll hand over to Roger now. Let me start by repeating the apology from Victor. Uh, Victor was a former director of the Ujiru unit uh, and was very concerned to be here today to participate, but he has a family problem which came up yesterday afternoon, uh, and so he's not able to be here. <coughs> um, I should correct the tape in the sense that I'm not the Dean of Arts at the University of Queensland. Anybody who knows QUT, uh, I was Dean of Arts at QUT uh, the last Dean of Arts at QUT, a bit like being the last King of Scotland. Um, <laughs> uh, and subsequent to that, I, I've held uh, appointments both in this building, uh, in, in public sector management, uh, 
uh, and then out at, at the University of Queensland. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not a Dean of Arts anymore. Um, what I wanted to do uh, is to encourage a, a large amount of interaction. So what we're going to do is to have two uh, set pieces from the Reynolds uh, and then uh, we'll have a uh, conversation. Uh, Uncle Bob may wish to come into the argument uh, because he was an important player uh, in North Queensland. We've heard a lot about his time in, uh, in Brisbane um, and the, the, the horrors in a sense of growing up in Brisbane. Um, but he also uh, played a very important role in the trade union movement, which is why we so welcomed him uh, to be the initial patron uh, of the TJ Ryan Foundation. So without further ado, I'll invite Margaret uh, to talk next, uh, and then I will um, convene a discussion after Henry has spoken to. Thank you very much indeed, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, uh, past and present, and particularly uh, to acknowledge uh, Uncle Bob, um, who, as you'll hear, uh, was uh, quite influential in uh, the story I'm going to be telling today. Uh, the, story that w the stories that we're going to be uh, reporting on today relate to our early arrival in the northern city of Townsville in 1965. And if you can imagine uh, these two youngsters, fresh from, from um, London, where we'd both been teaching, arrived in the tropical city and uh, found it was not Launceston in the tropics. We'd done some homework before we went there and we'd found that the population was roughly the same as Launceston, where I grew up in Tasmania. Uh, but as you can imagine, it was uh, very, very different. And the most, uh, the most impressive aspect that we first noticed was, you know, it was, for us, coming from London, a very multicultural uh, community because there was such a, a high um, proportion of the, the uh, residents who were um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island. Um, but of course, they weren't treated as part of the community. And we soon learned about uh, the, the Queensland Act and the differential standards that applied. And we cer certainly discovered the extremes of racism. I mean, the r racism that really shocked these two, two youngsters um, from Tasmania, though that, of course, is, is another story. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea, as youngsters are inclined to, to get involved and to do something useful uh, about the racism in Townsville. And I saw an advertisement in the local paper for the annual general meeting of Opong. And Opung, uh, as some of you may or may not know, was the one people of Australia League. That should have given me a little bit of a, a tip, but you know, at 24 or 5, uh, it didn't. So I went along uh, because I thought, well, this is an organisation that I'll learn from and I might find there's something that I can do. And at that meeting, there was only one other young person there, and that was uh, Roberta Sykes, Bobby, as uh, I always knew her as. And uh, so Roberta and I were very much welcome to the organisation because it was a tiny little group of mainly elderly people. And uh, I, uh, we came out of the meeting, I became secretary, and uh, Bobby became treasurer. So, you know, we got ourselves involved and because, unknown to us, there was very strong links with the uh, Conservative government in Brisbane, we were able to, or I was able to, assist in terms of ensuring that a number of families got access to their entitlements. But of course it was so paternalistic and so appalling that, you know, it just entrenched my uh, concerns further. And then the Gurindji uh, walked off uh, Wave Hill and uh, Uncle Bob and uh, a number of, of uh, organisers at the, trade, at the uh, Townsville Trades and Labour Council 
were organising a fighting fund. So Bobby and I had a cup of tea at, uh, uh, one morning and, and we said, we'd better give some money to the Gurindji, you know, that we got a bit of money and we controlled it because I was secretary and Bobby was, was, uh, <laughs> was treasurer. We'll give some money to the Gurindji. Now, Uncle Bob, I'm sure you don't remember, but we actually bought a bag of money from the Commonwealth Bank into the Townsville Trades and Labor Council as our contribution from Opal. I can't remember how much there was. There wouldn't have been much because, you know, uh, Opal was a very poor organisation in North Queensland. But, you know, we handed it over and we felt we'd done something, um, something to, to assist. Um, we want to know just what kind of an organisation uh, it was until quite a bit later uh, when we got involved in um, what was to become known as the uh, International Racial Seminar. The, we both worked, as did Henry and many others, on the campaign uh, for the 1967 referendum. And I remember handing out on the day of the referendum and the, uh, you know, the, ex the vocal extremes of commentary from so many people was, for me, incredibly shocking. I mean, I knew there was a yes and no vote, uh, but I hadn't, and I knew about the racism, but I hadn't appreciated just how vitriolic so much of the commentary would be. And of course the referendum, as you know, was, was successful and uh, gave the federal government uh, authority to, to include um, Indigenous people in, in the census and uh, also to make laws in their, their favour. And so a few people, led very much by Koiki Mabo, said, well, what does this referendum mean? What does it mean in Townsville? and how can we do something? Uh, I mean, Townsville in, in, at this time was very much a community where you looked around and said, it's awful, uh, what can we do to make, something, make it different? Um, and so uh, Koiki went to the Trades and Labor Council with this idea of, of having some sort of conference, seminar, event uh, about what the referendum meant at the local level, level and certainly in North Queensland more, more broadly. And because Bobby and I were involved in this organisation called, uh, called Opal, and perhaps because we'd brought a bag of money into, for the Gurindji, um, I was asked to run such an event. And at the time, I can remember just being completely thrown by this, saying, well, no, 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 we couldn't do that. It's too big and too important and, and we're only small, there's really only Bobby and I. And even though we were offered support by the Trades and Labor Council, I said, oh, no, let's, let's get the university involved, let's get the council involved. So the city council, it was a wonderful uh, deputy mayor, uh, Joan Innes Reid. I don't know that she was, a, she was deputy at that stage, but she certainly was a very prominent uh, councillor. And uh, so she helped us set up a, a, a public meeting, and we had... Uh, Great roll up, about 100 people uh, came to the roll up. To, uh, so you can tell what a mood there was for change in Townsville. And it was people who'd obviously supported the referendum but knew that it was important that it had an impact at the local level. And uh, so we, we uh, set up a committee the uh, Townsville Interracial Citizens Committee, and the seminar was to be called We the Australians, What is to Follow the Referendum? So you can tell that this uh, One People of Australia League had quite an impact on our thinking at the time. Um, then the trouble started. Well, before the trouble started, in actual fact, there were some very good things that happened. Local businesses got behind the, the uh, planning, uh, the council was very good, the university set up little working groups to do research and gather information about key topics, uh, education, employment, housing and justice. And uh, so for a, at least the first six weeks or so, we thought, yes, this is really going to be a good event and we're, we're working uh, to, with the whole community. We chose our speakers. 
Faith Bandler, Joe McGuinness, Professor Colin Rowley and Professor Colin Tatz. So we had two, two Indigenous speakers, two academics. Uh, uh, Colin was a, a, an historian and uh, uh, Colin was a political scientist. And then the trouble started, the, the whispers. The whispers included things like, do you know those Aborigines are being influenced by communists? And what's the university doing working with the council? Uh, all kinds of whispers started to go around the town and uh, a community of then 70,000, we heard them back. And then even stranger things happened. People would, uh, would, we were meeting every week and sometimes more often, and people would say, you know, a funny thing happened last night. I parked my car and when I got into my car, this car came up behind me and, you know, it followed me all the way home. And then it had happened to someone else. And then one Sunday morning, Henry and I took our, our um, young son out to a local playground and we came back and all my papers about this, the conference were scattered all over the floor. And because we lived on Melton Hill, there was wind coming through the windows, I thought, hmm, maybe it was just the breeze. But no, something was missing. The papers with all the names and addresses of our supporters, not to mention all the checks that we'd been gathering for for financial support to help bring speakers to the conference, they'd gone. So I was a bit panicked by this because it was a large amount of money and, you know, I was in charge of it with Bobby, but, you know, I was technically the, the secretary to manage it all. And so I um, rang someone, and I think I probably rang Fred Thompson, and uh, he, who was a leading um, member of the Trades and Labor Council at the time, and said, look, what do I do? I think we've been burgled. And he said, no, you haven't been burgled, because nothing else had been taken. It was clearly some sort of inside job. And we later learned that all this was Queensland Special Branch. We didn't know about Queensland Special Branch, being the naive, naive youngsters we were at the time. So I went to the police station, reported it, and of course they didn't take much notice of me, especially when I said nothing else had been taken. Those checks were returned to the, Queensland, uh, to the Townsville Trades and Labor Council a few days later. And uh, so we, we got our money back, but we, we don't know what happened to the list of names and addresses. Then other things happened, like the mayor decided he couldn't possibly open this radical event. Several people withdrew from the committee. The churches were in, in some conflict about whether or not to support the seminar. And uh, of course, a local radio station run by the National Civic Council, which might mean something to some people uh, in today. Uh, that was, uh, the, there was a, a directive that there be no mention of the uh, interracial citizens um, seminar that was coming up. Anyway, despite this quite bizarre and disturbing series of events, uh, the seminar went ahead. We had our wonderful guest speakers. We had 300 people attend, and it was a great event. Uh, and I would argue that it was one of the very significant events in Townsville at the time that brought community together, both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and many other members of the community in roughly equal numbers to try to start challenging uh, the local environment. At the conference itself, and we should have expected this, it was monitored by, you know, you've guessed it, a couple of carloads of police. And, uh, you know, this is December. You don't sit in a car in December in Townsville, uh, <laughs> if you can avoid it. But no, there they were. And we subsequently found out that, of course, they were taking the number plates of every car that came in and out to either attend or drop off some of the, you know, the, the food and other things that, that different uh, businesses had, had uh, donated.
The seminar, of course, made a number of recommendations about maintaining uh, work in those four key areas and, uh, um, um, of course, much of that work did continue uh, over many years. Um, but on the Monday morning, uh, there was, I had quite separately established something that was called Open Playgroup. Uh, as a former teacher, I was concerned about education and the fact that in those days, there was very limited preschool activity and uh, very few facilities. So I had uh, uh, set up this Open Playgroup. Uh, but of course, uh, Opal didn't want to. Uh, when they decided that we should have, they should have nothing to do with the seminar. So there I was in the position of uh, being secretary of both the interracial seminar committee and Opal. So they kicked me out. And they also kicked out Bobby. But we're quite proud of that. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so on the, on the Monday morning, off I went to the kindergarten as usual, which we ran. And again, cars came in to deliver children from all over Townsville. And different cars came back because we had a roster of volunteers to provide transport, you know, public transport that was, was appropriate at the time. And uh, of course, surprise, surprise, there was a carload of police sitting outside the church hall where I was going to run the, the kindergarten. And at first, it was one of those mornings when I was there with uh, a baby and uh, our son, so I had a baby in the meantime, uh, at, uh, and uh, there I was at the kindergarten with about uh, 18 um, four-year-olds and a carload of police sitting outside. And at first I was sort of a bit thrown by this, and then I thought, oh, well, this is silly. I might as well give them something to watch. So I said to the kids, come on, it's a hot morning, let's have water play today. So all the kids came out and we had painting and water play, and, and the police stayed there. And uh, of course they had to wait till lunchtime to see who was coming to pick the children up. Um, so that gives you just a little sample of what life was like in trying to address the serious issue of, of what was going to follow the referendum in North Queensland. And I suppose the purpose in telling you this story is that uh, today there are different issues, there are different challenges, but there'll always be someone trying to block you. There'll always be someone, whether it's government or, or business, dare I say, a, um, a sand mining company, um, trying to prevent civil society asserting their rights to, to live and work as they're entitled to in their communities. And I think that uh, what our efforts uh, demonstrated is, yes, we were blocked, yes, we had a lot of, uh, of controversy and a lot of unpleasantness uh, over that period of time, but in the long run, uh, we probably had the final say. Thank you. I'll now invite Henry Reynolds, again needs no introduction, to talk to us. Well, thank, <coughs> thanks very much for that. Uh, hard act to follow, of course, but I've been putting up with that for many, many years. <laughs> <laughs> now, as Margaret said, we arrived in Townsville a long time ago. I started teaching Australian history in 1966, and we arrived in Townsville at a particular moment, quite obviously, but it was a particular moment in terms of what was happening both in North Queensland and in the wider world. Now in terms of Townsville in particular, but also some of the other cities in, uh, in Queensland, there, what was happening was in effect the reurbanization of Aboriginal and Islander populations. Uh, those cities had been made white. I mean, people had been driven out of them, either to the far outskirts or completely, and in Townsville's case, uh, an offshore uh, concentration camp, in effect, that people couldn't leave. 
which was Palm Island. It was still, in a sense, a suburb of Townsville, but a segregated one. But by 1966, things were changing dramatically. That is, many people were being driven off the pastoral properties in the West because of uh, equal pay. They were simply being pushed off and quite a few of them made their way to the coast. The Torres Strait Islanders, who hadn't been allowed on the Australian mainland, uh, were uh, brought to the mainland in 1962 to rebuild the M Townsville Mount Isa rail line and quite a few of them, including the Marbos, uh, settled in Townsville. And the young men brought their families from the islands. And then for the first time, uh, there was significant change in Queensland legislation and people were being allowed to leave the reserves and missions and quite a few people came from Palm Island to live in Townsville. So there was this quite dramatic change right at the time we arrived. Now, as Margaret has intimated, I mean, there was a lot about it which we found very, very disturbing and shocking. I mean, there was a lot of violence in the street much of the time. Uh, there was uh, racism that was unashamedly racist. I mean, I think that's the point that you can say, oh, of course, Australia is still racist, but I mean, at the time, people were not at all embarrassed about being blatantly uh, racist in the things they said. There was also the inequality because Aboriginal and Islander people in many cases still didn't get uh, their social welfare. The money had been paid into the Queensland government. And so part of the work Margaret did was to uh, see that people began to get social welfare. And people lived in absolute poverty. I mean, their houses, they own nothing. I mean, it was a degree of poverty that simply doesn't exist uh, at, at the moment. And of course, the extraordinary discrimination. The social discrimination, uh, you know, conducted by the community itself, but also the, the uh, discrimination emanating from government and government legislation. Now, I want to talk uh, about my response to this uh, and then look at what was happening in the wider world before considering uh, w where we began to move once we thought uh, there is more to this than simply equality, uh, that a civil rights movement. Now, my reactions were that this was surprising and shocking because it wasn't what I thought Australia was about. Now, I grew up in Hobart which was preeminently the city of the convicts and the emancipists. 75 to 80 percent of people in Hobart had convict ancestry. Now, the families had forgotten or deliberately repressed their convict ancestry, but they had kept alive that sense that the convicts brought with them of determined to be, to, 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 to uh, express their equality and their hatred of discrimination. That was what the convict system did. Now, I grew up uh, in a primary school playground with the great-grandchildren of the convicts, and I learnt that equality was absolutely fundamental and a fair go. And this was just at the end of that great period of left-wing governments in Australia. So I thought that's what Australia was all about. When I came to North Queensland, I was so shocked that that wasn't what Australia was about at all. It was equal for the whites, but profoundly unequal for Indigenous people. Now, in some ways, I still think that's an important communal idea. And there are people who say, look, we don't need a Bill of Rights because there is in the Australian community this sense of a fair go and equality. Now, I think that is still there to some extent and still very important. But it only takes you so far. And as we found, it was all very well to feel this is shocking, but there was also that urge to do something about it. Now, the initial reaction was that this is a matter of 
basically of civil rights. We have to bring about much greater equality within Australia. Hence the idea of the One People of Australia League, the symbol of which, Margaret, was the opal, wasn't it? The multicoloured stone. But also, uh, this was the high point, if you like, of Aust the Australian civil rights movement, because for Catsey, which, which really forced through the referendum, was that sort of organisation. They were looking for equality within the Australian political system. But in many ways, to understand the period, you had to look beyond Australia. Because it was, an, uh, you know, particularly that decade, race was the dominating issue in global politics. For most Australians, the thing that obviously dominated the airwaves and the newspapers and the radio and television by then was the American Civil Rights Movement. The si famous Civil Rights Act was 1964. The great march between Selma and Montgomery was March 1965. So American civil rights was there as a constant reminder that race was a, a major issue. But in some ways, it was the global politics, that is, quite apart from the American experience, it was this was the culminating era of decolonization. When a great many ex-colonies gained their independence, particularly in Africa, so that by 1962, the anti-colonial bloc, for the first time, had a majority in the General Assembly. And then in the middle, of, you know, at the very moment we were arriving in Townsville, the Convention Against All Forms of Racial Discrimination was passed in December 1965. It was probably, Margaret, when we were going south to Hobart for the wet season, when racial discrimination, when the, conv the Great Convention was passed in New York. Now, these two things, that is decolonization, American civil rights, appeared to be part of one movement. But in many ways, they were at cross purposes. And this is important for both the time in Australia, but also the present in Australia. That is, the, the, the new nation states that were being set up all around the world did not, uh, almost all of them had minorities. And the new nation states had no desire that their minorities would be able to cause trouble in the new nation state. And after all, the United Nations had shown no interest in minorities in this period. It was only the ILO, the International Labour Organization, which took up the cause of indigenous people. Very little interest in the UN. The new nations were determined to have a cohesive nation, to absorb and assimilate their minorities. Not just Australia, but in many parts of the world. Now, that's why Australia shared both traditions, the civil rights tradition of the American sort, equality within the Australian state, but also there was the question, but wait a moment, don't indigenous people have separate rights that belong to them? And the first manifestation of this was clearly the question of land rights. Now, I don't think we were aware at the time that the Gurindji was a battle both for equality, particularly in terms of employment and wages, but also it was also a land rights movement. But it was much more obvious in the Northern, much more obvious uh, when, when it came to the, uh, the, uh, the North and the Go Peninsula and the struggle against the mining company and the famous Bark Petition of 1963, where it was unmistakably a demand for a different sort of right, that it was a return of traditional land. Now this brings me to these issues, and I can tell this story best by relating it to Eddie Marbo, who we knew from our very, very earliest days in Townsville. 
Now, Eddie was quite clearly deeply involved in, if you like, the civil rights cause. He was at the sharp end. He was a very proud black man who used to suffer. He was a cheeky nigger. And he often get, got beaten up for seeming to be too self-confident. So he was certainly deeply concerned with the civil rights part of the struggle, but there was something much more than that. And let me explain for a moment. And now, as many of you will know, he came from Murray Island. That is a very remote part of Australia, right up in the far northeast corner of Australian Territory, closer to Papua, in some ways having more relations with Papua than with Cape York. In lots of ways, Murray Island was scarcely Australian in any real sense. The Queensland government had adopted a policy which elsewhere in the world was called indirect rule. That is, the islanders ran their own affairs. I think there was only one white man on the island where he was growing, and that was the school teacher. Otherwise, the islanders ran their own affairs. And this meant that he had absolute certainty that his family owned their land. And remember, they were individual family land plots. It wasn't communally owned, it was individually owned. So it's not surprising that coming from this environment that, I mean, he was surrounded, you know, he was surrounded by traditional culture with almost no European indirect influence that is unusual in Australia at the time. And so when he came to the mainland, he, be, he was clearly concerned about numerous things. One was preserving his traditional culture for his children, because he wasn't allowed to go back to the islands. So the black community school was one of the ways in which he wanted to make certain his children kept their culture alive. The best known part of it was his determination to prove through the Australian legal system that he indeed owned his land. And that, of course, resulted eventually in the Mabo decision of 1890, uh, 1992. Historians. Um, now, the other question which takes us beyond what, we, uh, what, what seems in, uh, available at the present was his belief that he should be able to have self-determination and even a form of sovereignty over Murray and Darnley Islands. And when you think about it from his point of view, it is obvious. I mean, the Queensland government itself annexed those islands in 1879. But how legitimate or even how legal was that annexation? It certainly wasn't legal, I think, in international law, because you can only take over a territory either by treaty or conquest. And we wouldn't say it was conquest, and there was no army invading it. There was certainly no treaty making. So there was this, from his point of view, the belief that not only did he own his land, but that they had the right to govern themselves and even have a form of independence in the Torres Strait. Now, he wanted to make that part of the claim in the Mabo judgment. But his lawyers probably wisely said, no, look, if you try and push too far, you'll lose. Let's, let's get the right to property before we go for sovereignty. And that's as it occurred. So in a way, Mabo represented the bringing together of those two traditions I've talked about, the civil rights movement, but also the decolonization movement. And that raises that whole question of how do you decolonize in a settler society like Australia and Canada and the United States and New Zealand and even some of the South American countries. And in lots of ways, that is a tradition which we, we, in a way, seems less available to us now than it was even in the 
Let me just take you back that in the 1980s there was a very significant movement uh, for a treaty. Very significant movement led by people as eminent as Judith Wright and Nugget Coombs, the, the Makarata movement. It had significant support and it was possible then to seriously talk about, about treaty and sovereignty. The reconciliation movement when it began was designed to end with the, with the establishment of a document. And Hawke famously in 1986 signed the Barunga Statement which indeed promised negotiation for a treaty. At much the same time, the uh, James Crawford, now one of the leading jurists in the world, put out his report about customary law, uh, even providing legislation for the recognition of customary law. Now, in all of those ways, these issues are less pronounced now than they were then. But let's just go back to remember that there have been these, this dual movement. That is the movement for civil rights, for equality within and part of the Australian state. But there's also the question of are there other rights as well? And that is the sticking point for many Australians as you know. How can these people have extra rights? Don't they want equality? Well, let's give them equality, but then don't ask us for, for special things. But quite clearly the experience of many, many Indigenous people is that civil rights is only part of the story. And that indeed is a cause which Mabo certainly would have pursued had he not died so prematurely. I'll stop there because uh, I've dealt with many things and I'm sure we'll have a fruitful discussion to follow. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's been a masterful review um, of events that I was only on the edge of in Tasmania um, and then only on the edge of in Uganda and then only on the edge of in Northern Ireland in this very period. Um, so I think we have a, a very fruitful uh, contributions from the two today. I now invite people to ask questions. And there is a, a, a mic to be had. Anybody would like to comment? Yep. Get the mic and we'll be able to record your... <coughs> Excuse me, did I hear you say that Eddie Mabo could not return to Murray Island? Yes. Eddie Mabo could not return to Murray Island for many years. Uh, they had complete control over who was allowed to go there. He wasn't even allowed to go back for, the, for funeral family funerals. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he was going to be my research assistant. Great trouble with the university to get to, to, for him to be allowed to be accorded the status that he could be a research assistant and he was going back to the island to record his history and uh, he got to Thursday Island and he wasn't allowed to go any, any farther. Who were the they who stopped Oh, well, the, the Queensland uh, Department of Native Affairs. They controlled who went to and left the island okay. and he wasn't allowed to go back for many years. Now, you know, in latter years, uh, many of those people uh, embraced him. You know, Koiki was a hero, but in, there were some of those people who, who later then wanted to associate themselves with him were on the side of the government, didn't want him. He was a troublemaker from Townsville yes. and wasn't allowed back. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that's why I started talking to him, because he wasn't allowed to go back. How, how will you keep your children... How will your children continue to know about their culture when you can't go back. And that's why I asked him, look, you can't, you can't go back. How do you know your land will be safe? Mm. You know, how do you know your land will be there when you go back? And that's when he said, oh, no, everyone knows it's Marbo land. And I said, well, that's not true. <laughs> yes, he, he, uh, he, wasn't, he was a marked man. And I think they thought he was a communist, didn't they? They did. Uh, <laughs> And uh, he, uh, yes, he, he couldn't, couldn't go back to his homeland. Mm. The other yeah, thing I was yeah. going to just remark on quickly is the first time I became aware of discrimination was when I was about five in Emerald and there were nits in the, in the school. Mm. 
and the Aboriginal children had their heads shaved and covered in kerosene oh. and had to wear a hat, whether they had them or not. Mm. Whereas the white children didn't have that. And I remember going home to, to mum and saying, Mummy, you know, how come these children mm. have to have their heads shaved and wear hats and the other kids in the class with mm. knits don't have to do that? Mm. I don't know. While Monique is formulating her question, could I throw in one other comment, which was that in 67 there was this decision about Aboriginality, but the rest of Australia still believed in white Australia um, and the problems of contemporary attitudes towards non-white people mm -hmm. was very much influenced by what was going on in the, particularly in Africa and South Africa. Mm. Um, that seems to be an issue, but you can think about that. In the meantime, Monique. Um, thanks. I, I, I found the talks really interesting and so apt for the discussion that was on ABC um, yesterday, I think. Uh, a former uh, Liberal, uh, no, Labour uh, politician worrying about identity politics. And it seems to me that what you're talking about and this problem between the two, the, the two uh, ways of looking at things, the civil rights and the other rights, is one of the big issues of the moment because I think the civil rights ends up in assimilation mm -hmm. for minority groups mm -hmm. and that's what is not being understood or is being understood and being <coughs> stirred up uh, deliberately. Mm. Margaret, do you want to comment on that? Yes. Well, of course, um, Opal was promoting assimilation at the time, yeah. and that's why um, you know so many of their attitudes seemed just completely out of step with the the well, internationally very much out of step uh, because we were very much influenced by the Bobby and I used to spend a lot of time talking about the civil rights movement in um, the US. And it's where I got the idea for to rename the kindergarten, kindergarten Head Start after the Head Start scheme in, in, the, in the US. Mm. Um, but uh, yes, Opal was very, very controlling, uh, very paternalistic, and it was all about, yes, we had to help our black brothers and sisters, but only on our terms. Uh, and that was you know, very clear from anything that we ever received that was written down. Mm. Could, could, uh, I, could I put I a question here to, to Uncle Bob? It seems to me that the trade union movement still believed in white Australia. Well, uh, that's and true. there was yeah. an extent to which there was tension must have been inside the union movement. Well, that's, that's true too. And it, well, the, in that part, the, uh, I, I would say the Australian Workers' Union that had uh, coverage of um, of, of, uh, of most of the areas where Aboriginal people were employed. They, they weren't parties to any uh, uh, decision making or discussions that would bring about a, uh, a reasonable conclusion and rights and justice to, uh, uh, to Aboriginal mm -hmm. workers. And that is still the position today where the Queensland Council of Unions over recent times have been trying to work out a resolution of the money that's been held in trust for Aboriginal wages still in this day and age, and they wouldn't come in to assist that process. Yet they uh, had coverage of the pastoral industry where all Aboriginal people uh, were working, both, uh, both men and women. Uh, the matter of Opal, one people of Australia League, which indicates a, an assimilation uh, process from uh, uh, my point of view, and I do remember the particular woman that was in charge mm. in Brisbane here, and. Uh, and her, uh, uh, the, the attitude of April here was to uh, uh, completely control the lives of Aboriginal people that they may be able to, uh, to influence. Uh, the back, uh, I had a good rapport with, uh, uh, with Eddie Koiki Mabo when I was, for many times, I, months uh, and times I spent organising uh, for the Building Workers Union in Townsville. And I was with him, he was working on the uh, Townsville Harbour Board on one of the mud barges there that used to keep the, uh, the channels open for the, uh, the, uh, the, the vessels trading in and out of the port of, uh, of Townsville when he's come up with the idea of uh, challenging the status quo of uh, Terra Nullius.
and he, uh, he succeeded in it. And if you read the, uh, uh, the transcript of the, the decision, the High Court decision of Mabo and others, it will it'll tell you what, uh, uh, what the result of that was. But the thing about it was too, if you read it in full, uh, what they were saying that uh, uh, the Miriam people could, uh, they could uh, hunt fish and go gathering, they could sing and dance and have ceremonies and conduct their own affairs. Uh, but they were subject to order and council and uh, the, uh, the Queensland laws, as long as those laws were not in conflict with Commonwealth laws. Mm -hmm. So Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, they shackled to uh, uh, the Westminster system. But I uh, conclude on that note, uh, we were very good friends. And uh, on the 4th of July 2011, when the High Court of Australia met on Minjerba, Stratford Lake Island, listened to submissions and said that the families uh, named are uh, the traditional owners and our national native title rights were recognised. Uh, Benita Mabo and his wife was there <coughs> to share that moment with us. Last wonderful question. things that happen with wonderful people. Thank Last you. question comes from one of the homes, is either Beryl or John. Uh, over to you. <coughs> I did talk to Judith Wright and to Nugget about the treaty. Uh, Nugget spent a lot of time up at North Australian Research Unit and I was on the board at the time and I spent time up there. Uh, and I didn't get very far with getting an elucidation as to how you would proceed towards a treaty. I think Nugget, in a sense, got very fixated, if I can put it that way. Uh, got very strong in his opinions, but um, I think he sort of drifted away from a sense of reality in his later years as to how this could be done. And indeed, I still have questions as to exactly how we would move towards a treaty, whether it be a succession of treaties to particular groups of Aborigines or whether it's one single treaty for the entire Aboriginal population. Uh, and uh, how you proceed on this. And I, I don't think anybody has really gone ahead with that matter sufficiently to make it a realistic proposition. Mm. Yes, before, I, I... Before you answer, we will have a session on just oh, that okay, issue okay. With, with Heron yeah. uh, later on in the, in the second session. But over to Henry well, for the briefly, last word. Look, I agree with you. It's important that uh, there is real thinking about what might be done. Uh, and is it a, a, a single treaty with all the First Nations or is it a series of treaties? I mean, that, that is, and, and without some definite uh, blueprint about what might happen, to which there is at least substantial agreement, if not unanimous agreement, it's very difficult to pursue it. But the fact remains that Australia has at its very heart a fundamental jurisprudential problem. That is, uh, it's quite clear that the Mabo judgment recognised in effect that the, that the Aboriginal people had sovereignty over Australia. That is, they, they exercised law over specific bits of territory, and that is sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened to the sovereignty? How did it disappear? And in international law, there's only two ways you can gain sovereignty. You can conquer it up until uh, 1950s with the Geneva Conventions. You, can, you could do it by force or you could do it by treaty. Now, Australia says, no, we didn't conquer it. There were no treaties. So there is still that fundamental problem. If uh, Aboriginal sovereignty disappeared, did it disappear immediately? Did it disappear bit by bit? Uh, or if it disappeared bit by bit, are there still bits of it left? Mm. You know, there are still profound questions which haven't been answered. And uh, that is why it's a question that won't go away. You know, we say, oh, we're a rule-based people, we believe in international law, but there's a fundamental problem at the heart of Australian settlement. Mm, it isn't true of Canada, it isn't true of the United, not true of New Zealand, because they, they recognise sovereignty and sign treaties. Australia didn't. Mm. So there's a, an absolute problem that sits there. Well, I agree it's a problem. I'm not sure how we proceed. No, no, no. no. Well, well, I hope this wise audience will help guide yes, us. Yes, we will uh, have uh, a chance uh, uh, to vote. Uh, the, the introduction of national and native uh, title is a clear indication that there is a pathway there to do that.
without, without any shadow of doubt at all. It's, 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 I'm it's, sure we can keep going on this. I, I'm very keen that we get to drink our coffee. Absolutely. Um, yeah. and, uh, White with one. <laughs> <laughs> you can continue on, Uncle Bob. Absolutely. Uh, Wonderful.